Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with a news item on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu. Alok Verma opts for retirement, says natural justice scuttled. Now, let me once again tell you the background of the CBI controversy. And after this, we will no longer discuss this issue unless and until there is a dramatic development on this particular matter. Now, CBI is the premier investigation agency in this country. It is headed by a director. Now, how is this director appointed? According to Lokpal Act, this director is appointed by a committee consisting of the Prime Minister, Chief Justice of India or the nominee of the Chief Justice of India. And the third member is leader of opposition in Lok Sabha or the leader of the largest party in Lok Sabha. Now this committee recommended the name of Alok Verma as the director of the CBI and Alok Verma was appointed as the CBI director. What about the other officers of CBI? For example, special director and other officers below the rank of director in CBI. According to DSPE Act, Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, all the officers to CBI of the rank of SP or above, all these appointments shall have to be cleared by Central Vigilance Commission. That means if appointments to CBI are to be made at the level of SP or above, all these appointments must have to be cleared by CVC. And this is how CVC clearance was given to Rakesh Asthana and Rakesh Asthana was appointed as the special director of the CBI. And his appointment also was cleared by appointments committee of the cabinet. That means CVC gave its approval to Rakesh Asthana. His name was then sent to cabinet. Appointments committee of the cabinet cleared his name and Rakesh Asthana was appointed as the special director of the CBI. But then director and special director of the CBI, they were at loggerheads. There are newspaper reports which say that Alok Verma was not in favor of Rakesh Asthana being appointed as the special director of the CBI. Rakesh Asthana is considered to be very close to the current government. He is a Gujarat Kader IPS officer. It was his investigation which led to the indictment and then the imprisonment of Lalu Prasad Yadav in the notorious fodder scam. But when Special Director Rakesh Asthana took charge, there were a series of differences between Special Director and the Director. And then what happened? Accusations started floating. Special Director Rakesh Asthana accused the Director Alok Verma of something. What is that? Rakesh Asthana was investigating Lalu Prasad Yadav in the railway scam. Rakesh Asthana is alleging that Alok Verma was interfering in his allegation into the IRCTC scam in which Lalu Prasad Yadav is an accused. Alok Verma on the other hand accused Rakesh Asthana of accepting a bribe of 5 crore, 3.85 crore rupees, so on and so forth. And then in an unprecedented move, the CBI filed an FIR against its special director Rakesh Asthana. And then in a midnight coup, what the government did, government ordered Alok Verma as well as Rakesh Asthana be sent on a compulsory leave and ultimately both these officers were removed from the CBI. Mr. Nageshwara Rao was appointed as the interim director of the CBI. Matter went to the court. Rakesh Astana approached the court that this FIR which has been filed against me should be quashed, should be cancelled. Alok Verma on the other hand, he approached the Supreme Court asking the Supreme Court how can I be removed? Because under the Lokpal Act, I have a security of tenure. My tenure is fixed at two years and if I will be CBI director or my tenure is till 31st Jan, how can I be removed before my tenure expires? And if this is the committee which recommended my name, why was this committee not consulted when I was removed from my office? Ultimately, Supreme Court sat on this matter for some months and then 
a couple of days ago, Supreme Court ordered that Alok Verma be reinstated as the director of the CBI. But then this committee should decide what are the powers going to be. This committee was entrusted with deciding the future scope and role of the CBI director Alok Verma. And then what happened? Prime Minister, the nominee of the Chief Justice of India and Mr. Malikarjun Kharge, the leader of the single largest party in Lok Sabha, they met and ultimately by a majority of two is to one. Alok Verma was removed as the CBI director and he was appointed as Director General of Fire Services, Civil Defense and Home Guards. Mr. Alok Verma then opted for voluntary retirement because he says natural justice is scuttled. Now what is this natural justice? That becomes important from our examination point of view. There are three principles of natural justice. Principle number one, nobody shall be sentenced without being heard. Nobody shall be the judge in his own case and the authority shall act bona fide, that means in good faith. And it is the first principle, nobody shall be sentenced without being heard, that Alok Verma says has been violated in my case because I was not heard by the selection committee and I am opting for voluntary retirement from the services. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. But let me tell you something else and I will link this to another topic for discussion. When we talk about judiciary, there are various concepts that come to our mind. For example, judicial review, judicial activism, judicial overreach. Now for the past three to four years, during my lectures and in my tablet classes, I'm using a term called judicial evasion. That means on controversial topics, judiciary is not interfering at all or judiciary is not committing itself at all or judiciary is not giving the verdicts at all if the issues are politically controversial. For example, on Ayodhya, we still do not have a verdict. Similarly, on demonetization. When demonetization was carried out in 2016, many petitions were filed in the Supreme Court that this decision of demonetization is illegal and against constitution. Why? Because if 500 and 1000 rupee notes are to be removed from the circulation, they won't exist as legal tenders. But this is our property. 500 rupee note, 1000 rupee note is my property. If you look at this note, it says I promise to pay the bearer the sum of 500 rupees or 1000 rupees. So this is my property and right to property is a constitutional right under article 300 capital A of Indian constitution. How can you violate my right to property by an executive order? That means you should have passed a law in the parliament and this parliamentary law should have authorized demonetization of 500 and 1000 denomination notes because that's exactly what was done in 1978 when high denomination notes were demonetized by the Janata Party government in 1978. An ordinance was passed but the 2016 demonetization was carried out through an executive order without any parliamentary law. Until date, we do not have a verdict of the Supreme Court. We still don't have a Supreme Court judgment whether demonetization was legal or illegal, constitutional or unconstitutional. But even if there is a verdict on demonetization tomorrow, the entire purpose of this demonetization verdict would only be academic in nature. Why? Because Supreme Court could only say you should not have done this or you should have passed a law to authorize demonetization. But the demonetization exercise is complete. 86% of these notes have been taken away from the circulation. When the demonetization exercise is complete, then after two and a half years, three years, we have a Supreme Court judgment. It will only reduce this judgment to academic discussion. Nothing more, nothing less. That means this is another concept of judicial evasion. And now in yesterday's newspaper article, there was a beautiful column on judicial evasion written by Gautam Bhatia. Now I'm adding another concept called judicial irony. What is the judicial irony? That means judiciary recommending yardsticks for other organs of the state, but violating the same yardstick for itself. How? Judiciary said that principles of natural justice are not found anywhere in the text of our constitution. But these are the principles which pervade our entire constitutional document. 
that means there is no mention of these principles of natural justice but we can say that principles of natural justice are integral to article 14 of indian constitution but the same position taken by the judiciary on principles of natural justice judiciary has violated the same principle itself how there is a medical college in up it was banned by medical council of india because of some allegations that you cannot carry on with the admission facilities then there are allegations there are newspaper reports that this medical college of up approached few officials approached few judges as well and ultimately bribes were exchanged so that this up medical college can get a favorable order from the supreme court that means basically supreme court will strike down this medical council of india order and will order that this medical college in up can continue to admit students into their mbbs program when the matter went to the supreme court supreme court gave its order that this mci order restricting or restraining this medical college from carrying on admissions is illegal that means this medical college will continue to admit students into its programs the judge who heard this case was justice deepak misra and justice deepak misra later on became the chief justice of india a pil was filed in the supreme court that there should be investigation into the allegations of bribe giving and taking in this up medical college case this case was heard by or this pil was heard by justice chalameshwar justice chalameshwar what he did he constituted a bench of the supreme court so that this bench of the supreme court will decide whether investigation should be carried out or not into these bribery allegations but then justice deepak misra was the chief justice of india justice deepak misra said this bench is dissolved because i am the master of the roster i will allocate cases to different judges of the supreme court justice chalameshwar is the number 2 in the supreme court hierarchy i am the chief justice of india so as master of the roster i will decide which judge will hear which case in the supreme court the matter was then decided by justice arun misra and other judges because justice deepak misra then allotted this pil to a bench one of the members of this bench was justice arun misra and arun misra rejected this public interest litigation but a question was asked to justice arun misra and other judges on this bench that are you not violating principle of natural justice which is nobody shall be the judge in his own case because the finger is pointed towards justice deepak misra because he gave the verdict in that medical college case that means if there are allegations although not proven but there are allegations against the chief justice itself how can chief justice decide who will hear my case whether it will be arun misra or justice chalameshwar is it not violative of principles of natural justice which is nobody shall be the judge in his own case and these judges said this principle of natural justice which says nobody shall be the judge in his own case it does not apply to the chief justice of india and that is another concept that we have learned today the concept of judicial irony because principles of natural justice were in the news and that is why we had to discuss this another concept of judicial irony that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article now let's look at another newspaper article on page number 5 me too time limit on filing complaints likely to be relaxed now what is this me too this phrase was used by american activist tarana burke for the first time in 2006 to define sexual assault at the workplaces then it spread like a wildfire in 2017 when hollywood producer harvey weinstein was accused of serious sexual assault then one campaign was launched in which people were asked or women were asked if you have faced similar sexual assault instances in the past just type me too so that we can understand the gravity of sexual assault at the workplaces and then this me too campaign entered india as well but not many people know that india's tryst with me too began in 1992 when bhavri devi was raped in rajasthan Bhavri Devi when Rajasthan government announced a campaign against child marriage in Rajasthan she actively participated in that campaign 
but the upper caste men in Rajasthan could not fathom that a lower caste woman is asking upper caste to shed their preference for early child marriages and then she was brutally gang raped in front of the crowd in Rajasthan and ultimately when the matter went to the court the court exonerated all those alleged rapists and set them free one argument given by the judge was that two accused in this rape one is an uncle the other is a nephew but in our Indian society we can never expect that an uncle would carry out sexual assault in presence of his nephew and this was one of the reasons why these rapists were set free and the perpetrators of this gang rape against Bhavri Devi they were discharged by the judiciary after that four women's organizations and one including Vishaka an NGO approached the Supreme Court asking for detailed rules or regulations which can prevent the harassment of women at the workplaces and that is how in 1997 rules were issued by the Supreme Court to prevent sexual harassment of women at the workplaces and these rules came to be known as Vishaka guidelines and based on this Vishaka guideline in 2013 a law was passed by the parliament called prevention of sexual harassment at workplace 2013 according to this law any employer it, if it employs more than 10 people it has to set up an internal complaints committee and if there is a company which employs less than 10 people then a local complaints committee has to be set up at the district level that means this act is applicable to all women whether they work in organized industry or in unorganized industry including domestic workers for domestic workers there will be local complaints committee set up at every district for organizations which employ more than 10 people for them an internal complaints committee will have to be set up and this internal complaints committee whenever a complaint is filed before this committee this committee shall have to complete its inquiry within 90 day period and then this committee will submit its report to the employer or to the district authorities and then this employer or the district authority they have to take action on this report within a period of 60 days that means the report which is submitted by this internal complaints committee and all organizations are mandated to set up this internal complaints committee but there was one problem the problem was if the incident of sexual harassment happened today then within a period of three months you will have to file this complaint before internal complaints committee but because of this me too movement when we saw incidents of the past 10 years or incidents dating back to 20 years ago they were also in the public domain now a government committee was constituted headed by home minister Rajnath Singh and in all likelihood what they are recommending they are recommending that this three month period should be relaxed that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article now there is another newspaper article ISRO cranks up Gaganyan project for that please go through our Gaganyan video the link is provided in the video description you will find out everything about what this Gaganyan project is all about now let's look at international news on page number 10 Ranil Tables report on constitution proposals now this is Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka there was a civil crisis there was a civil war why because Tamils in north and east of Sri Lanka they were discriminated against the Sinhalese Buddhist majority in Sri Lanka they were discriminating the Tamil speaking minority in Sri Lanka and one organization LTTE decided that they will take up arms and they will liberate the northern and eastern part of Sri Lanka which is the Tamil dominated area and we will create a separate country a separate Elam for Tamil speaking population Mahinda Rajapaksa was the president of Sri Lanka for 10 years and it was during the presidentship of Mahinda Rajapaksa that an all-out war was launched against LTTE and LTTE was defeated United Nations says that the worst human rights violations were committed during this civil war or during this war against LTTE 
But then the health minister of Mahinda Rajapaksa, what he did? Maitripala Sirisena, he resigned from the cabinet and he decided to contest presidential elections against Mahinda Rajapaksa. Maitripala Sirisena was supported by Ranil Vikramasinghe. And this coalition of Maitripala Sirisena and Ranil Vikramasinghe was supported by the minorities in Sri Lanka, the Tamils and the Muslims and ultimately they won the election. Maitripala Sirisena became the president of Sri Lanka. Ranil Vikramasinghe became the prime minister of Sri Lanka. And they had one promise. They had a promise that we will have a new constitution in place and this new constitution will provide more autonomy to the northern and the eastern part of Sri Lanka, which is dominated by the Tamil minority. The Tamil National Alliance, which is the main political grouping of minority Tamils of the north and the east, they have also been at the forefront of a campaign for a new constitution. But then something else happened. What happened? Maitripala Sirisena removed Ranil Vikramasinghe as the prime minister and appointed Mahinda Rajapaksa as the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. But Maitripala Sirisena asked Mahinda Rajapaksa to prove majority on the floor of the Sri Lankan parliament. But he didn't have the majority. He lost the confidence vote. But he refused to accept the no confidence motion. And ultimately what happened? Maitripala Sirisena, he dissolved the Sri Lankan parliament and called for fresh elections in January 2019. Matter went to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court of Sri Lanka said that the dissolution of Sri Lankan parliament is unconstitutional and we should not have new elections in place. The existing parliament will continue. And then Maitripala Sirisena had no other option but to appoint Ranil Vikramasinghe as the prime minister. And now when Ranil Vikramasinghe is the prime minister, he has tabled a report on the proposals to draft a new Sri Lankan constitution before the Constituent Assembly of Sri Lanka. Now what will happen? There will be discussion on this draft in the Constitutional Assembly. Then this draft will be presented to the parliament. And after that, there will be a referendum where the people will be asked to vote on this new constitution. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at page number 18 of the Delhi edition of the Hindu. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has unveiled the first pictures of a rocket called Starship. And this Starship may one day carry people to the moon and the Mars. So this can be a potential prelims based statement in your examination. Now let us look at some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper beginning with No Freedom Without Equality at Sabrimalai written by Ananya Vajpayee. She draws equivalence to two events in our history. One at Sabrimala and then B.R. Ambedkar's Mahad Satyagra of 1927. Now there was a ban on the entry of menstruating women in the age group of 10 to 50 into the inner sanctum sanctorum of the Sabrimalai temple. Supreme Court last year said this is anti-constitutional move. Women of all age groups are allowed entry into the inner sanctum sanctorum of the Ayapa temple at the Sabrimalai. Now we saw two women. They managed to enter into the Sabrimalai temple despite protest from the people who said that it's our culture which is supreme and not the constitution or not the verdict of the Supreme Court. Then when these two women managed entry into the Sabrimalai temple, then we saw that the high priest of the temple closed the temple and then this temple was purified. Because two menstruating women or impure women managed entry into the Sabrimalai temple, we'll have to purify this temple. Similar thing happened in 1927. We know that how the Dalits were mistreated in our history. There used to be separate wells from which Dalits could fetch water and separate wells for the upper castes. Bihar Ambedkar himself a Dalit, he was mistreated even when he was in school. Even in school, sometimes he could not drink water because the well from which he was authorized to drink the water because he was a Dalit, this well was dry. Then he launched a civil disobedience movement. What happened? At the Chavdar tank at Mahad in 1927, he started an act of defiance. 
what he did he brought in large number of dalit men and women and ultimately b r ambedkar himself took the first step of drinking water from this well and then what happened the upper caste they did something similar to what priests did at sabrimalai they poured 108 earthen vessels of panchgavya which are the five organic substances associated with the holy cow for example milk urine cow dung and this 108 earthen vessels were poured into the tank at mahad to purify this tank so that means something similar happened in 1927 and now we are purifying sabrimalai temple because two menstruating women managed entry into the sabrimalai temple but ananya vajpai says that this is the india of 2019 and that was the india of 1927 In 1927 the British government supported the upper caste against the dalits because after revolt of 1857 british realized that the one way in which we can carry on ruling over india for decades together is we should not interfere in the religion of the people because these indians are very touchy about their religion we will not interfere in their religious matters and we will continue to rule over india for centuries together in 1927 it was the british government which supported the upper caste or which supported this practice of untouchability but now in 2019 we have a republic constitution and this constitution talks about article 14 which is right to equality it also talks about article 25 which is fundamental right to practice is your religion and there has to be a fine balance between article 14 and 25 if freedom of religion means that you have the freedom to practice and pursue your religion it does not mean that you have a freedom that you can undermine the fundamental rights of others freedom of religion also does not mean that you can violate the writ of the supreme court because if the supreme court says that women of all age groups are allowed entry into the sabrimalai temple we cannot have any system in place which will violate the writ of the supreme court that is what is mentioned in this newspaper article written by ananya vajpai now let's look at another newspaper article on page number 6 hurrying through a legislation it talks about the recent quota bill that was passed by the parliament but when we discuss this quota bill on 9th january i told you that you should not read anything related to this quota bill again but this column is different it uses quota bill as an argument but its argument is something else we have a separation of powers between legislature executive and judiciary but at the same time we have doctrine of checks and balances as well judiciary should hold executive accountable judiciary should hold legislative accountable but legislative should also hold executive accountable and the passage of this quota bill proves that legislature has failed in its duty to hold the executive accountable how does legislature hold executive accountable through questions through debates through motions through resolutions through the passage of bills as well what is the process let's say for example this is a bill this bill is to be introduced in the parliament let's say lok sabha before its introduction two days prior to its introduction in lok sabha this bill is circulated to all members of the parliament so that these members of the parliament can decide when this bill will be introduced in the parliament what should be my approach should i oppose this bill should i support this bill what is the other alternative that i have this constitutional amendment bill to provide for 10% reservation for economically weaker sections of the society was not circulated to the mps 2 days prior to its introduction that's problem number 1 there is another problem when this bill was debated in rajya sabha congress mp ahmed patel he stood up and said i have nothing to say about this bill except one what is that one thing at 11 am when the question hour began in rajya sabha one question was asked to a minister that is your ministry exploring the scope of providing reservation for poor candidates from forward communities in education as well as in the employment and if you are exploring the possibility of reservation please give us the detail the ministry responded as of now there is no such proposal under consideration 
that means 11 am question hour started this question was asked to the minister minister said there is no such proposal under discussion and at 12:48 or 12:46 pm this constitutional amendment bill was tabled in the parliament providing 10% reservation to economically weaker sections of the society that means you are basically lying in the parliament that's another problem but if you look at this issue in slight detail normally once this bill is introduced it is referred to a select committee and it's a beautiful practice because let's say for example there are 545 mps in lok sabha not all these mps can together participate on a particular bill that is why committees are constituted so that these 10 members will look into bill a these 10 mps will look into bill b these 30 mps will look into bill c so on and so forth so that in these select committees of the parliament in depth analysis of this bill is carried out but unfortunately this bill also was not referred to any select committee and it's important to point out when a bill is referred to a select committee then the members of the parliament they can go back to the public which elected them and ask the public what are your views on this particular bill so that i can incorporate your provisions or your suggestions in the bill which is pending in the select committee or i can meet with the experts before forming my recommendation in this case clearly a constitutional amendment bill that means within 2 days constitution stands amended and this bill was not even referred to the select committee of indian parliament but mr madhavan raises another issue and compares this with the british model this article highlights three important ways in which british parliament works better than indian parliament first there is an absence of anti defection law that means members of the parliament are free to hold their own opinions are free to discuss a particular bill in whichever way without any fear that i will be disqualified if i violate the stand of my political party if i go against the stand if i go against the whip issued by my political party that's number 1 second speaker in britain speaker is assured of his seat because no party contests against the speaker in the next election in india let's say for example sumitra mahajan she belongs to bjp she is the speaker and if she wants to contest election the next time she will have to depend on the party ticket of the bjp that means she might toe the line of the bjp that means she may not be impartial in her dealings inside the parliament this is another way in which british model works better than ours because in britain the speaker is secured as no party contests against the speaker in the next general election and third in britain it is known exactly how each mp voted that means they have a clear cut way to determine whether this mp voted in favor of this bill or this mp voted against this bill but in india there is a difference in india if you would have watched the recent proceedings of this constitutional amendment bill passing in the rajya sabha and lok sabha we only see the number of votes in favor of a's no's abstain and total we do not know how a specific mp voted whether he voted in favor or against and then this final paragraph becomes very important for you to understand you can in fact carry the clipping of this article and memorize this article by heart because this is a very beautiful article you can you can mention the points mentioned in this article in your answers and i will tell you in which question you will have to incorporate the points mentioned in this article however our parliament often falls short of these goals due to some structural reasons these include the anti defection law lack of recorded voting as a norm party affiliation of the speaker and the frequent bypassing of committees just 25% of the bills have been referred to committees in this lok sabha insufficient time and research support to examine bills and lack of calendar that means parliament is held at the convenience of the government we need to address each of these issues to strengthen parliament and protect our democracy that is what you need to understand from this newspaper column now let's look at prelims based questions consider the following with respect to gaganyaan isro will send four astronauts into space this is wrong three astronauts will be sent into space india could potentially become the fourth country to send a man to space 
this is correct which of the above statements are correct b2 only because after the erstwhile ussr the us and the china india can become the fourth country to send a man into space denmark also has a manned mission and this manned space flight is scheduled for 2022 this is the context isro cranks up gaganyaan project which of the following statements about rat hole mining is incorrect this is used for extracting coal yes it is practiced in the red corridors areas of india no red corridor areas are those areas which are affected by left wing extremism maoists naxalites for example but this rat hole mining is primarily going on in northeastern india ngt has banned it but has revoked the order ngt has banned it but it has not revoked the order so both these statements are incorrect so 2 and 3 is the correct answer because the question asks you to identify which of these statements are incorrect map based question which of the following statements about xinjiang province are correct it is the largest chinese administrative division correct it borders the countries of mongolia russia kazakhstan kyrgyzstan only this statement is wrong so which of the above statements are correct only one what is the correct answer tajikistan afghanistan pakistan and india it also borders the xinjiang province for explanation this is the map previous year's prelims based question the ngt has been established by an act whereas cbcb central pollution control board has been created by an executive order of the government cpcb is also a statutory body it was set up in 1974 under water pollution act then it was given more powers under air pollution act of 1981 so this statement is wrong the ngt provides environmental justice and helps reduce the burden of litigation in higher courts whereas cpcb promotes cleanliness of streams and wells and aims to improve the quality of air in the country which of the above statements are correct only two that means b is the correct answer main special parliament as an institution has failed to hold the executive accountable for its actions suggest ways to improve accountability and ensure parliamentary supremacy in indian polity and the column that we discussed today written by the head of prs legislative research those points you can incorporate while writing answer to this question that is it from our newspaper analysis today thank you for being with us have a great day